Well, then I will introduce our speaker to you. We are fortunate today to have William Cotter, whose nickname is Bill, uh, speak to us about uh, the state of our narcotics enforcement uh, agency and efforts uh, in our county and perhaps in our country. Uh, a uh, problem that uh, we all respect and feel fortunate that the problem in Hancock County, in my humble opinion, is not as bad as it is elsewhere. And I believe one reason that this is true is because of men and women in our narcotics agency working for the sheriff in particular uh, are doing such a good job. Uh, most of us haven't had a lot of ex street experience with drugs, so we are a little uh, isolated from this uh, and don't realize what's going on uh, in real time. But Bill Cotter does. And uh, I'm going to give you a brief uh, uh, description of him. He is... Uh, a local boy. He was born in 1994. He attended St. Stanislaus and Pearl River Junior College. In 2013, he entered law enforcement for the city of Waveland in their uniform patrol, and he was in the narcotics division of Waveland. Uh, he uh, automatically became part of the Federal Task Force of the DEA, or Drug Enforcement Agency. He is married to Courtney Rist, who is a nurse who's from Gainesville, Florida. He has two children, William, a five-year-old, and Denise, a two-year-old. He lives in Diamond Head. He also has, he's an entrepreneur and has a small landscaping business in Diamond Head. He now works for the county sheriff's office in their narcotic division. And so we uh, are eager to hear from Bill, who, by the way, has some props. Uh, and I'll give him the floor now. Yeah, I'm going to bring these up in just a minute. I just want to thank y'all for letting me come in here today. Um, it is really easy for me to chase bad guys with guns and stuff. It's very hard for me to come here uh, and talk to y'all. Like you said, I didn't finish Pearl River Community College. Public speaking is one of the classes I did not finish. <clears throat> so, yes, I work for the Hancock County Sheriff's Department. Our narcotics division has six agents that actually investigate narcotics. Uh, two of those guys, Mr. Jasby, who's supposed to be here, who I'm replacing, are assigned to DEA's task force, Drug Enforcement Administration task force. I myself, am, I'm also assigned to Homeland Security task force. We have two criminal interdiction units assigned to our, our unit. We have, I believe it's four canines, um, or, or usually on the streets you see in the canine marked vehicles, and which are also assigned to our division. We have a Bay St. Louis um, investigator who's also uh, assigned to our, our office that we work with. Waveland did have somebody, but they're currently uh, facing some staffing shortages, so they're, hopefully they're going to join us here again. Our big thing is working together. He, he wants to speak very highly of, of, of the, our, my unit that I'm a part of. We really rely on just relationships, relationship with our patrol division, relationship with our other agencies. We're a very small community. We, we need those. Also, we need y'all. Like We get so much information from y'all. So I have some awesome props here. They are not real drugs, so don't get too excited. <laughs> so, can y'all hear me without the microphone? Yes. I'm really good at yelling. Get on the ground, show me your hands. So, 
So we kind of talked about it. A lot of the drugs, uh, back in the day, marijuana was the main thing that came across the border. Marijuana is, he said, at least 80% of the drugs that was coming across the border. Today, most of the drugs we're seeing, Mr. yeah, let me try. Hey, don't deny him, you listen. Come on. I might have to get up here so I can actually see the stuff. So, like I said, a lot of the drugs that used to come across the border was marijuana. We still do see a lot of marijuana. Most, all, probably all the marijuana we see today is coming from California, Oregon. It's all stuff that's actually uh, made domestically. The drugs that we are seeing crossing the border is methamphetamine. It's the primary drug we're seeing on our, on our streets here in Hancock County. Second is gonna be like the synthetic pills. We're seeing a lot of fake pills. We see a lot of those. Uh, fentanyl. We are seeing a good bit of fentanyl in our, our community. So this is some of the, these are, uh, ah, these are real fake, fake pills. They're not fake fentanyl pills. Just kind of demonstration, a chart of all the pills we have. This is different types of drug paraphernalia. Drug paraphernalia is anything they use to actually inhale, inject, measure out. It could be bags they use for, you know, to, to sell. They also consider um, for teaching the Reserve Academy alcohol as a, as a drug. This up here is the, the they used to have the meth labs all. Thank God, my 10 years in law enforcement, I've never had to deal with a meth lab. And that has been since the Sudefect Act has come out and they just flipped that, that, I think about a year or two ago, where you no longer need a prescription to get Sudafed. We were worried about that, but luckily we haven't been seeing those type of labs, those labs not only are they, are they making controlled substances, but they're also generating waste uh, that's very, we have to have a hazmat team come out to clean up that type of waste. And it was, they were using typical stuff that you can get from, from Walmart. You'd see them in Gatorade bottles, just laying on the side of the road. It was very dangerous when those were around. So on the, on the next one, you have like some of the, the, the heroines we see the, the cocaine, the crack cocaine, and those type of things over here. Um, we don't see a whole lot of cocaine anymore. We get it here and there a little bit, a little bit of crack cocaine. It's just, it's not very prevalent here. Uh, in the bigger cities, Gulfport, they get a little bit more of it. And it, it, where their bigger party crowds are, they have a lot more of that stuff. We are starting to see a little bit more of MDMA, ecstasy, those type of drugs, um, but it's, it's still not some, something huge on our radar. Our primary focus is mainly on the methamphetamine and the heroin. Most of the heroin we're getting is coming straight out, out of the city of New Orleans. So can I tell you as far as what we do is on an investigative standpoint, our patrol guys is where a lot of this stuff generates from. Our patrol guys are awesome. Bay St. Louis, Waveland, and the Sheriff's Department. They're out here on these streets every day. They see stuff, whether it be a traffic stop or somebody just walking down the street and they're finding drugs. What we try to do is take that individual, um, debrief them, get the best interviews we can. We're not worried about putting this guy in prison for a long time, we're trying to work our way up. So we, we take, there's a, there's a great case from um, City of Ocean Springs. A gentleman pulled over, this is before the synthetic marijuana was really big. Uh, Ocean Springs Police Department gentleman pulled somebody over for like a, as little as a seatbelt violation. Smell something that smell like marijuana, tested it in his little roadside test kit and did not show for marijuana. Called a DEA agent out there. It, they determined it to be the synthetic uh, spice, what they call it. They were able to find who the dealer of is that, and they worked their way up, and they actually indicted the first Chinese national out of the Gulfport, Mississippi, for synthetics being shipped into the United States. And it, it's just awesome being right here, you know, just from a, a a patrolman making a traffic stop for a seatbelt violation. So that's the kind of stuff we do. We also use, do control purchases. Um, everybody asks, hey, do you do undercover? I'm really bad at it, but it's fun. So I try to do it every once in a while. <laughs> um, it, it is fun. The adrenaline dump, it, it, it is fun to try to do. 
Um, so I, I'm going to kind of open the floor up to y'all. I'm sure we're going to have some great questions. Any, <laughs> what you got? So we we will we will work with them on cases. Um, we've used them here recently on one of our big cases. Uh, they, they are great. They, not only Marine Patrol, out of Gulfport Homeland Security the agency I'm part of, they have uh, Marine interdiction boats that they actually get farther out outside the Barrier Reef. The, the boats coming back from Mexico or from other places that are from international waters, and they kind of check those kind of boats out. Marine Patrol is great at doing that stuff as well. A lot of them are, a lot of them are international, um, Mexico. Uh, we don't see a lot coming from like Cuba or stuff, but the, the, the gentlemen, the, the guys that are working down there, they're, they're intercepting drugs every day on boats. Uh, a guy recently sent me a, a, a picture, like two tons of like cocaine. I can't fathom that. Like you're talking about $20,000 a kilo. That's a lot of money in cocaine. They're seizing that kind of stuff in, in those foreign offices down in like St. Thomas, Puerto Rico, stuff like that. On Interstate 10, you will see two or three cars parked there, and they're not looking to get people that are just going a few miles over the speed limit. You have a lot of informants, I'm assuming, that are letting you know when drugs are coming through on I-10 because they stop specific cars and they seem to always come up there sometimes confidential informants so I don't know if I have any or not no those guys are up there and they do enforce traffic laws but their thing is, is taking it beyond the stop those guys can see anything from drugs um, smuggling of, of illegals they've hit big credit card rings before they had a recent seizure of a bunch of uh, counterfeit money they get stolen cars up there like crazy all the time there's a bunch of different things going up there I-10 is a long stretch and is a corridor and a lot of a lot of the criminal activity passes through here. So we have we have some great guys up there that are really good at doing their job. So I know she's been trying to get <laughs> My question is, what is the primary source of drugs? I mean we know they come through Mexico or whatever. But where are they actually created? Most of the methamphetamine itself is is created in super labs in, in Mexico. Okay. So they're actually making hundreds and pounds at a time. The, the fentanyl, the, most of the synthetic drugs we're seeing are all produced overseas, China, um, the heroin's all overseas, the Middle East and stuff. And, and uh, cocaine is? Still, still south of the border, um, Central America, Southern America. Yes, yes. This has just gotten so risky. Um, these got, they, they were blowing up. And luckily, this was going on when, well, while I was still in high school. Okay. But they were having these things blow up. People were getting injured quite often from it. House fires were happening from it in, in those type of areas. But uh, luckily, I have not seen one. Yes, ma'am. So, the, the user is also a problem. They are a, a victim to, to the drug. But the problem with not, I, I am worried about the user. We have to find the right ways to get the user off the drugs. If that's putting them in jail for a certain amount of time and finding them at a rehabilitation center, that's the, what they need to do. Because if we just don't do anything with the user, the user's gonna go back out there, commit crimes to get their, to get their drugs. I've, I've seen them as young as juveniles on serious drugs, and um, it, 
just about everybody. It, it's it's crazy to see. We're talking about now. What's happening with the youth in our community? It is very rare to see them using the hard drugs, but we have seen them. And I love talking to these people, especially the users. I want to find out what caused them to start using drugs. 90 plus percent of them, they all started using marijuana. The other, it's probably less than 10 percent, uh, it started with a doctor. That's mainly your, the, the individuals that are using heroin now. Uh, they got some type of injury and they're now addicted to heroin. But most of them are, are started with marijuana at a young age, hanging out with friends for the wrong reason. They start using marijuana. That gets them going down the, the wrong path and just caught up the wrong house, get peer pressured into it. So our high schools have done a phenomenal job. They've put up these, they like metal detectors, but they, tech, they detect uh, the vapes. I don't know too much about the vapes. I don't use any type of tobacco products. I couldn't tell you too much, but they're good at getting any and all tobacco out of them. It, 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 as far as serious drugs, if they're still going to school, it's gonna be very slim, very slim. So when you stop somebody and they end up confiscating, let's say $200,000, $300,000 that they have in the vehicle or $25,000, it makes no difference, do you eventually end up getting a portion of that to your police department to help run this program? Our, our county does. Our county will receive it. So depending on, on what it, it would use for, if it was drug proceeds, it goes a certain route and can only be used for certain things. It can't be used for salaries or anything like that. It can be used towards bettering our agencies for as equipment, vehicles, that kind of stuff. Years ago, Biloxi Police Department on all their vehicles used to have a little saying, this vehicle is purchased by proceeds of, of you know. And I thought that was awesome. That was awesome. Do you know how many, how much, how many dollars you got in the county from that program? I, I could not tell you. It's been going on long before I ever got in. There, there, there's been a, a plenty of legends up there on the interstate that are just really good at doing their job. So when after we get <laughs> after all the, all the court, I will not tell you the address, but we bring it to the state. The state has a an actual uh, incinerator. They put everything in and burn it. I will not give the address up to anybody. So. <laughs> but no, it, it is pretty interesting. They they slam it all in there. It gets super hot, and after they open it up, it's just dust. So. Yes, sir. It, it is, it is. Um, a, a lot of them are repeat offenders. Um, we, we, do, we try to do our part. We, we have some great uh, district attorneys over here and they, they're doing their part. We just have to keep working together, keep putting them in jail and hopefully we scare them and they go back to Louisiana or somewhere else and do it. We, our our focus is getting them. Yes, sir. Has, has the, the growth of technology really helped in the effort that you all have? Like I've, I've, I've read of uh, police cars that can read license plates and drive, you know, basically tell who's going up and down the interstate. And if you come through more than once in a short period of time, you're, you're stopped and that kind of kind of uh, technology. I mean, that's that's what I've heard yeah. is, is a rumor. Or the, I don't know if that's true or not. The but gentleman, Mr. Marcus Jasby, if he'd have been here, he could tell you all the tech stuff. I can barely use my iPhone, <laughs> but I know it does work. I don't know the, the whole details about it. Um, some of the stuff I've used in, in as far as narcotics investigation, right. and in the past six years I've been in narcotics investigation, it, the technology has been awesome. Yeah. And it, it's almost passing me, I'm, I'm 31 years old, and I just, it, it is great, the technology. What kind of surveillance do you have like for inter interception communication? So a lot of that stuff as far as communication will be held on the federal level. Uh, the state has laws saying that only certain agencies can intercept wire or telephone conversations. Yeah. Um, cell phones, basically. Yes, sir. You watch, watch people moving around on their cell phones and all that. Yeah, and the, the state lim uh, limits us to, to mainly federal agencies to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do we have a homeless population in Hancock County? We do. We do. And it is growing. Since my time here, back in 2013, 
2013 when I first started working here, we had two homeless gentlemen, and they were the same guys for a long, long time. One of them was deceased, and the other one went to jail, and the population has increased a lot. Since the King's, King's Kitchen, the great people up there, it, they, they bring a lot more into the community. Um, so if you build it, they will come? Sadly to say. So how many homeless people would you estimate? A lot, a lot more of them. When I worked for the city of Wavenant, I could tell you just about every homeless person we had in the city. So we were dealing on a daily basis. People just complained about them. They didn't like them out in front of their, their businesses for obvious reasons. Um, I couldn't tell you now. We don't have a lot of them in the county. There is a good bit in the Bayside Park community that just live in tents and stuff like that. But there's a lot more of them that are hanging out in the cities because they have a lot more resources closer to them. A hundred? thousand? I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't think any more than a hundred. I wouldn't think so. For the county? Yes, sir. Not like New Orleans. Not like New Orleans, no. Are they coming across the border or is that? I haven't seen any, any that are, are illegal. Most of them are just passing through. They'll hang out for a couple of weeks and go into New Orleans or go eastbound. So. Yes, ma'am. Uh, another off-topic question, but similar. What information do you have about the amount of human trafficking that goes on here compared to other places? So the part of the task force I'm on, they do a lot of that. As far as human trafficking, we don't see a lot of it. When we get any type of lead on a possible human trafficking, we love to jump on that stuff because we want to keep it out of here. We do see a lot more human smuggling, so just illegals being transported from one destination to another. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the human, the little bit of human trafficking stuff we do see on the coast is a lot in Gulfport, Biloxi area, where the more casinos are, more hotels are, and that, those kind of things. I did not make this. <laughs> so, but no, the, 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 the PowerPoint we had that, that we teach the police academy, it, it kind of talks about recognizing drugs and uh, people under the influence of drugs, then also comparing it to people under the influence of alcohol. So some of the same the pharmaceuticals can kind of show the same as the downers and, and the alcohol. So that's kind of what we have it in here. Some people do mix drugs with certain alcohols. I don't, So I'm, I'm only aware of one, and this was um, 20, 2017, 2017, 2018. There was one, and it was a guy who was kind of making pills for himself. That's the only one I, I've, I've come across in, in, in Hancock County. They, they are, it, the crazy thing is you can purchase that online from Amazon and get it shipped to your house, and it's not illegal. It's only illegal... One, if you have an actual, you're making a controlled substance, some type of illegal powder to put into it, or you have an actual dye that <coughs> misrepresents it as an oxycodone or as a Tylenol. So. Is, uh, is underage drinking a big problem in the coast? I know you talked about that when we passed. Any idea? I don't know. I'm not in uniform patrol anymore, so I don't, I don't get to see a lot of that anymore. There's always been some parties here and there that I, I'm aware of. Um, I don't know too much about the, the bars in downtown, if that's a problem or not. You really don't hear about it? Um, I, I do it's not. It's got to be happening, but... Uh, yeah. I would hope that yeah. they're pretty strict in the ballrooms because I feel like that could be a lot of problem. Um, so, so it's a surprise there's, there's, there's no more knowledge of it. Yeah. What's going on? It's, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a big problem. Yeah. Talk about the dogs for a minute. I stay away from them for the most part. We have some really nice, we have a lab. She loves us. So these dogs are amazing. A lot of these dogs, the, the, the ones with the pointy ears, like your German Shepherds, your Belgium Island Walls, most of those dogs are imported. There's a gentleman in southern Louisiana who trains those dogs, who does a phenomenal job, has been doing it for years. We have, a, I think, at least one or two master trainers. 
So they go bring whichever deputy's gonna be a canine handler and they go pair them up with a dog before they even look at the purchase. These dogs are super expensive. They go, we just sent two of them Monday to class to get new dogs. And they spend, I think, five to seven weeks down there just learning the dog, learning everything about it. These dogs are, they are so smart. They can, if we cut one loose in here and somebody had drugs on them, I didn't bring the dog, but if somebody had drugs on them, it, it would go and find you and it would alert. The dogs alert different ways. Most of them are, are passive, so they'll sit down, lay down, or something like that to kind of let us know. What would be the range, say, that they would be able, how far away could they detect dogs? So it has a lot to do with the wind. In, in a perfect environment, those dogs can smell everything. Wow. If the winds, and it kind of gets into like the tracking stuff. I'm not, I don't know too much. I've had some hunting dogs in my life, but I've never worked a police dog. But if they're tracking somebody and the person loops back around and the wind's coming from that direction, they can usually change the scent and, and kind of go straight to wow. them. They say like the dogs, like we smell like a beef stew, we smell like the, the, the strongest ingredient. They say the dogs can pick out every ingredient in there. Wow. A lot of the big interstate loads of, or big loads of drugs that we get, people will have the drugs in the container, then they'll put like mayonnaise, then wrap it up, put dryer sheets, wrap it up, and the dogs can still find it. It is impressive. And do you consider marijuana a gateway drug? Mm -hmm. I, I do. There's a big argument about that. I do. Um, yeah. I, I, like I said, I like to interview people. I like to talk to people and kind of understand how they got it. And I'd say 90 plus percent of them say that their first drug they ever used was marijuana. Yeah. Now, there's plenty of people out there that have used marijuana, marijuana only, but. And do you think it's because then the pushers get in touch with them and start encouraging them to other drugs? Or that they find the need to go to bigger drugs. And it could be that they could be out of marijuana and say, well, I have this, why don't you try this one out one time? Yeah. And they're down or for whatever reason they're going to a party and they want something. Hey, let's give it a try. They tried the marijuana, they liked it, let's not try something else. Yeah. What, what impact is this uh, the change in marijuana rules? What, what is that to the rules even for what you're doing? I don't know if y'all saw a few months ago we did a <laughs> Executed a search warrant up on the highway. There was a store that was misrepresented. That's an active case. Can't talk about it too much, but we get a lot of. It's going to kind of turn into getting complaints of, hey, this person is illegally selling it out the back door and stuff like that. So that's the kind of stuff we look into. Um, like I, I hope, I hope it works out. I know it's going to probably take a couple of years for the bill to, or to, for the new laws to work out, but I have hope in it. Um, and the only thing that kind of worries me about the marijuana, we kind of talked about this earlier. Uh, the marijuana, you know, everyone says, hey, it's, it's grown from the ground. What's so bad about it? Most of the marijuana today is not grown from the ground. They're spraying all types of different things on it. Um, it's a lot stronger than it was 10, 15 years ago. So it used to smell like, like an actual skunk. This stuff today has got so many crystals on it, different colors. It's not as natural as it used to be. And that's the only thing that kind of worries me about it. Thank you very much. Oh, she's cutting me off. <laughs> share with you that uh, Bill comes from uh, a, a family that has a tradition of public service. Uh, you may recognize the name Bill Cotter. He was uh, the recent head of the Port and Harbor Commission. And his father uh, is uh, famous in Hancock County. And he wrote about it in, uh, years ago in our articles about the Port and Harbor case. Because uh, he ran the airport for about 20 years. And uh, 20 years ago, the airport was just, they call it puddle jumping type uh, uh, airplane airport that was a nothing. And in 20 years, it morphed it into uh, an enormously successful uh, enterprise. The, the, the tenant park is full. If you ever go in there, say, to their little runway cafe, you'll see it's loaded with servicemen uh, and women who are pilots and airmen. And 50% of the business that they do there is with various agencies, the Department of Defense. And I'm not talking about the Space Center. So uh, uh, the Bill Cotter's uh, in our Hancock County 
are now in the second generation of, of serving us. So thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank y'all. Is that an example? <laughs> There's a guy, Dimitri on back.